Hey everybody, we're in the garage today pulling the blown LS7 out of Goldie here. And this time we've got a special guest. My father-in-law, Jeff, is here from Chicago. He's an old school muscle car guy and he offered to help me pull the motor. I, I've been a little bit surprised by how many comments I've gotten about how clean the garage is. And I know that it is clean, but it's not super clean. Like I don't have OCD. I've just realized that I get stressed if I can't find a tool because I've taken like all my tools out and they're just scattered around. But the effort you put into that eventually pays off in terms of not wasting time. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. What will be the first plan of attack here? That's a great question, Jeff. And for that, we're going to consult my printed out <laughs> task oh, okay. list. The first thing that we're actually gonna do is drain the oil because I haven't done that. And we are gonna be removing the, the dry sump lines and the tank. And before we do that, we don't want any oil in the car. I'm realizing I just put on brand new squeaky clean gloves and I'm about to change the oil. Maybe I'm gonna fish the old gloves out of the trash just for the oil change. There you go. <laughs> Never throw anything away, that's my model. Oh, not surprising, but uh, we got all coolant to start. I was wondering where all the coolant was because there wasn't a lot left in the radiator. Oh, That's a lot of coolant, man. Well, look at that. I think we just proved that coolant is indeed denser than oil. We're learning new stuff all the time around here. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Goldie was previously a bone stock C6 Z06 done a lot of work to the car already to get her ready to be a GT3 killer, but the engine was stock. Turns out that might've been a mistake. I didn't get the heads fixed and I dropped an exhaust valve at the racetrack, which blew the motor. So here we are getting ready to do my very first engine pull. Okay, I'm the guy who tightened this. Why is it so tight? I'm just trying not to bust my knuckles this time. Always better to pull. See, these are the kind of tips that I need in my life. Always better to pull, guys. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Well, if it wasn't already completely obvious, I'll say it out loud. I am very much a hobbyist mechanic. I am no expert by any means, but I'm really enjoying learning and I'm eager to get better at it. And the only way to get better is just to do stuff. But I've realized that to get better faster, surrounding myself with people who have more experience than I do, like Jeff, is definitely going to accelerate my progress. And so I really appreciate his patience with me and all the tips and tricks he provided. And maybe more importantly, just having somebody there to bounce ideas off of is huge because I tend to just run with whatever the first idea is that pops into my head. And believe it or not, that's not always the best way to do things. All right, I mean, we can't say that that was done cleanly, but uh, no excessive mess was made yet. What I've got next on the list is removing the uh, dry sump system. So we've got lines and we've got that, that oil tank. Well, I see the oil lines are connected here on the bottom, right? Yep. So the oil lines are gonna have to come off completely. So, looks like this is gonna have to come off just to get to that tank anyway. By the way, somebody was asking where all the parts were, and we've got parts hanging out over here. And then I've also got parts hanging out on top of these cabinets. Everything's not quite as neat and tidy around here as people seem to think. You said you weren't touching any tools, and here you are lying underneath the car asking for a 13 millimeter box wrench. Uh, actually, a pillow would be more appropriate. It's so funny to me how motivating it can be to watch somebody else working on a car. And even though Jeff was originally gonna just kind of hang out in the garage and chat with me and observe as I worked on it, I mean, we're on step two of the process and he's already lying on the floor turning wrenches. I love it. Oh, fuck. Hey, nice. So we've got the dry sump lines removed from the oil pan, but in order to fully remove them and get the dry sump tank out, we're gonna have to get the fender liner out. And unfortunately, even though my quick jacks are really handy, they're getting in the way of some of those fasteners. All right. Even though I feel like our safety measures are adequate, I'm gonna try to avoid having my fingers 
under there for any prolonged period of time. And since I don't know what size these are, I just kind of brought them all. If you hear any creaking sounds, scream and I'll pull my hand out real fast. This is the point in the process where I always start thinking about, would it have been faster to just like get it off of the quick jacks and onto jack stands all the way around? If you haven't noticed, overthinking things is basically my superpower. Holy crap, there's a dragonfly in here. Whoop, ah! So we got a dragonfly caught in some spider web. Let's see if we can rescue him. He looks like he might be in trouble. Oh, hey, there he goes. He's not 100%, uh, but at least those spiders aren't gonna get him. Look at these guys. I, see, people say my garage is clean, full of spiders. My other superpower is that I can be distracted by literally anything. Spiders are mad. They're like, hey man, we keep your garage free of insects. Let us have the dragonfly. What were those spiders gonna do with that dragonfly anyway? Like, were they really planning to kill it? I don't think so. That is our dry sump oil tank. Did you know that the C6Z06 was the first Corvette fitted with a dry sump? Doink. Those are our oil lines. I've been told since there's a risk of contamination, just buy new ones, but I won't throw them out just yet. While we're down here, I'm running 315 with tires on the front, which are pretty huge. And I thought I didn't have any clearance issues, but uh, we got a little bit of rubbing going on on the brake ducts. It's even worse on the other side. So just FYI. What's up, Louie? You having a good day, bud? All right, so here's the top of the dry sump tank. Looks like we've got a bracket here that's holding some other wiring harness stuff. Son of a f This is a situation where I have no excuse. I can't blame my experience level because I've removed thousands of bolts and nuts. And in this case, I could tell that there was a risk that this nut was gonna drop down into the engine bay when I removed it. But instead of thinking to myself, hey, how am I gonna capture this nut and make sure I don't drop it? I was like, oh, I'm just gonna take it off and see what happens. And surprise, surprise, I lost the nut and had to go get my magnet. So my hope is that by shaming myself on YouTube, I will finally learn my lesson. You know what this needs? More cowbell. The other thing that's hard to learn as a mechanic is when to start twisting it with your fingers. Because every time I try and I fail, it just makes me want to give up. You got to put the wrench back on. Well, it gets like worse as you get older and you have no grip. What are you talking about? That's never going to happen to me. I'm going to be young forever. While we're wrestling the dry sump oil tank out of the car, it dawned on me that some of you might not know what a dry sump system is. Basically, a regular car has what's called a wet sump system where all the oil just hangs out in the bottom of the oil pan, gravity pulls it down there, and then your oil pump has a pickup that pulls from the oil pan to provide oil to lubricate the engine. Well, a wet sump isn't typically good enough for a race car because under heavy cornering, that oil can slosh to the side of the oil pan. And if that happens for a long period of time, the pickup for the oil pump might starve for oil and you can blow your engine. So a dry sump setup uses a separate tank as a reservoir for the oil. And because of the shape of the tank, the oil can't slosh away from the pickup. So the oil pump pulls the oil out of that reservoir and that's the tank that we're removing from the system. This Corvette is the first Corvette that Chevy ever fitted with a dry sump system. Hey! It's like landing a fish. For 2009, when they came out with the ZR1, they increased the capacity of these by two quarts, and people think it was to fend off oil starvation in high G corners, but you can clean this out and send it to Lingenfelter and they will like weld on an expansion to increase the capacity. I think they charge 300 bucks to do that. Now I may be my own harshest critic when it comes to my mechanical skill, but there is one thing that I do right. And what I do is every time I finish a step, I bag and label the parts that I took off the car because otherwise I'm gonna forget what they were and where they go. 
And then I clean up after myself a little bit and I put my tools away. And I don't know, maybe I like doing it because it's just an easy win, but it makes me feel good. All right, so we checked three things off the list. We drained the oil, dry sump lines, and the oil tank. There's like eight more things to go, but it's lunchtime, so we're gonna take a break. And by the way, guys, I hit the jackpot. My wife is a trained chef. She was a professional pastry chef for a lot of years. Lunchtime in my house is always awesome. If you ever get the opportunity to marry a chef, I highly recommend it. In order to get the engine to clear the steering rack, we need to basically drop the cradle out of the way, which drops the steering rack along with it. So you support the engine, drop the subframe, and, uh, and now you've got room to pull it out. But I accidentally went a little too far with disassembly and I got the entire uh, power steering pump out of the way, which means that we could just remove the rack to get the rack out of the way. And then we should be able to just, you know, lift the engine right out. It should be as easy as that. What do you think? I think taking the power steering pump was part of the plan. When I was thinking ahead, I removed the power steering pump. There you go. We're gonna head over to Harbor Freight, get a hoist and an engine stand because we're gonna need those before too long. On our way to Harbor Freight. How do you feel about Harbor Freight? Uh, to be honest with you, it's not my favorite tool place, but in a way it is because they have everything there. Exactly. Heading to Harbor Freight with Jeff brought back my very first memory of going to a hardware store with my dad, and I still have the pocket knife that he bought me. And my dad, he was a car guy, but not into sports cars the way that I am. He was just into cars in general, but he was very much a DIY guy. And the house that I grew up in, in a small town in Pennsylvania, my dad built it himself. And he wasn't a carpenter, he was a band director, he was a public school educator, and he started that project when he was about the age that I am now. How intimidating that must have been, but he pulled it off, and I'm so impressed by that. And yeah, the, the hardware store trip, man, it, it made me miss him. I'm not crying, you're crying. Well, we got thrown a little bit of a curveball when we got back from Harbor Freight. We noticed a strong smell of brake pads from Jeff's F-150. We diagnosed it as the front passenger side caliper was sticking. So we went to the auto parts store, bought a new caliper and slapped her on there. Good thing we found it now and not when Jeff was halfway home to Chicago. It is the dawn of a beautiful new day in the garage. And I wanted to give you an update on our foster dog, Ruthie a.k.a. Toothless Ruth. As my mom used to say about one of my ex-girlfriends, Ruthie has been ridden hard and put away wet. This dog was an absolute mess when we got her five months ago, clearly abused and neglected. This poor dog, she had all of her teeth filed down, and we think that that's a sign that she was used as what they call a bait animal in dog fighting, which is absolutely terrible but she has bounced back in a major way. Thanks really to my wife, Nicole, who has put a tremendous amount of effort into helping this dog. And finally, as of making this video, Ruth is ready for adoption. So please help us get the word out. Look in the description and in the comments, there's a link to where you can get info about how to adopt her if you're in the Atlanta area. We'd really appreciate your help. You ever get that feeling when you make a video and at the beginning of the video, you're trying to convince everybody that you're not OCD about keeping your garage clean. But then as time goes on, you realize that you're editing hours of footage. It's just you cleaning your garage and you start to realize, wait a second, maybe I do have a problem. Maybe I should talk to somebody. No, is that just me? <laughs> okay. So this may have already occurred to some of you, but it did not occur to me until after we had assembled this stuff. But buying an engine hoist and an engine stand represents a pretty big commitment, not only in terms of money, but in terms of the space it takes up. 
When I was looking at it inside the store, it didn't seem that big. And then when I saw it in my garage, I'm like, these things take up an entire bay. Now with a lot of their tools, Harbor Freight offers a good, better, and best option. And I think their good shop crane costs like a hundred bucks. And it's kind of amazing that you can get a shop crane for a hundred bucks. Quality is a little bit iffy, but if you step up to their best thing, it's super affordable compared to something like Snap-on, but you also get features like the ability, in this case, to fold these things down and make them take up a little bit less space. But they are still very big and heavy. And the thought had not occurred to me until Jeff mentioned it later, but apparently you can rent these things and maybe that would have been a better option for me because I don't know how many engines I plan on pulling, but who knows, maybe this is the start of my career as an engine builder. All right, we're ready to get started today. Got this fancy new engine hoist and the engine stand here. I am kind of surprised by how big they are. Oh well, uh, first order of business today is to get the power steering rack out of the car. Commence. Your steering rack is hooked up to your tie rods here. And in order to get the rack out, you've got to remove the tie rods from the knuckle. All right, there ain't nothing a hammer won't fix. There it went. Okay. So this turned out to be the first challenge when it came to pulling the motor. And the reason for that is that the steering rack is a really big, long piece and the ABS system is in the way. Okay. You know, when they design and build these cars, um, they, they really tightly pack the engine bay and it's really impressive what they do from an engineering standpoint. But serviceability is not really at the top of their list. And if you want to do things in the easiest way, you almost kind of need to remove everything in the opposite order that it was installed from the factory. But of course you try to save some time and you say, hey, I'm not gonna remove the ABS system, that would be silly. So we're gonna figure out how to get the steering rack out without doing that. And as a result, it's a little bit tricky. But I will say that having Jeff in the garage made the process so much easier. I made a joke recently oh, yeah. about how they put goats into stalls with racehorses to calm them down. Jeff was so patient in the garage. He was definitely my garage goat. And I mean that in the kindest possible way. Oh, it's just a party in here somewhere. Look at that. Nice. The steering rack was tough, but there was worse to come. Much worse. All right, next up, we're going to disconnect this AC compressor here, but we don't want to let the refrigerant out, so we're gonna leave the lines connected. So we got a couple of bolts up here, and then down below, we got a couple more bolts that I think we should be able to reach with the socket. AC refrigerant is about a thousand times worse as a greenhouse okay. gas than carbon dioxide, so you really don't wanna vent it to the atmosphere if you can avoid it. The problem we've got is that there isn't room between the block and the frame rail to get the compressor off. I'll have you know that 1.6 to 1.8 percent of my audience is female. Really? Yeah. Now that might just be That's good. Nicole and my mom. Uh oh. Guess what's happened now? Yeah. I, I I don't even have to guess. I already know. What have I done? Have you guessed what happened? Yeah. I was backing one of the bolts out that holds the AC compressor onto the block, and I backed the bolt all the way into the frame rail using my ratchet. And so my ratchet became stuck against the frame rail. And if I turned it any further, which I did, I ended up making it worse. And so now I've got to figure out how to get a tool in there to switch the ratchet to go in the opposite direction. Somehow this has never happened to me before, but obviously it's happened to Jeff and that's how he would have known to avoid it. I will be avoiding this in the future for sure. We might have just gotten it. Hey. So my ratchet was free, which was a relief, but the bigger problem remained. There was no way to get the compressor free of the block. Now I knew it was possible to remove the engine without disconnecting the AC lines because I saw a video on YouTube of it being done, 
But still, it made me feel kind of uncomfortable to say, hey, I guess we're just gonna have to punt on this for now. Is there enough play in these lines that when we lift the engine, that the compressor is gonna come up with it and eventually get high enough that we can just pull it off because we'll have room when we get above the frame rail. Maybe it'll just fall off by itself while we're messing around with something else. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is gonna be a first for me. I've never messed with a starter before. You wanna loosen up the wiring first? Yeah, that makes sense. Oops, wrong way, Josh. Well, even the most patient garage goat has his limits, and I don't know exactly what set him off, but at this point, I think Jeff realized that he needed to step in a little bit and notice how subtly he takes over the starter removal operation. Hey, let me see that for a second. Yeah. You hold the starter. Uh, can you fit in there? Let's try. I should just have a ratchet and an extension, right? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Your mind is being blurred by getting the engine onto the stand now that we got a stand. All right. Yeah, there you go. Like we're fighting. I got it. This, you got it? <laughs> well, I just ordered this yesterday. In order to use the hoist to lift the engine, I need something to hook it onto. And so I bought this valley cover lift plate that's specific to LS engines. It bolts right onto where the factory valley cover goes. It was starting to feel like the closer we got to the point where we could actually pull the engine out, the more we ran into trouble. And in this case, we're trying to disconnect these transmission cooler lines, which are attached to the block with brackets. And these lines have disconnects that you can see right in front of where the bell housing connects to the block. It might've been possible to pull the motor without disconnecting these, but it looked pretty straightforward to remove them. And so we decided to, to take them apart. And, um, you know, I'm gonna spare you all the gory details this took way, 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 way longer than it should have. And the fundamental reason for that is that we just didn't understand how they went together. There were sort of threaded covers that were holding them together, but what we didn't see was that there were also these little kind of circlips that were underneath that threaded cover. And it took us longer than I want to admit <laughs> to, to figure out how to get these things apart. And frankly, it's embarrassing to watch the footage of me trying to do it. But yeah, this is something where reading about it ahead of time probably would have saved me a ton of time. But again, having Jeff there with me in the garage made it way better than it would have been otherwise. And in fact, Jeff was the one who ended up getting these things disconnected. How's it going down there, Jeff? Trying to uh, avoid getting a bath in my favorite fluid transmission fluid and of course that insult to injury when one of these little circlips finally came loose it went flying and we never found it there it went oh where did it go? i heard it go up and not back down oh, God. <laughs> so if any of you guys have a part number that would save me the trouble of figuring out what this thing is actually called i would appreciate it there's the result and uh, those silicon plugs are just coming in handy. They left are and the right. best, man. I think we're getting close, though. Yeah. Hey, this thing this where is... you're doing all the work, I'm kind it's of enjoying out that good part. For you? Yeah. <laughs> and while I'm thinking of it, I just learned today from one of you in the comments that those silicon plugs that I love so much, they are not fuel safe. They will dissolve in fuel and turn into jelly. Thank you for warning me because I am using them to plug my fuel lines. The last thing I need to remove from the block is the oil cooler. It's really handy for track work that has these because an oil cooler really keeps your oil temperatures down if you're doing a long track session. But the downside is it takes forever to get the oil up to temperature. So a lot of guys block these off. Okay, we think we have literally everything disconnected from the motor. We just need to undo the bell housing bolts. And in order to get the crane in there, we are gonna have to remove the front clip, unfortunately. Um, but the good news is we think that we can get the motor out without moving the car at all. We're just gonna lower it to the lower level on the quick jacks. That's gonna move it backward a little bit and get it down a little bit lower. And hopefully we're gonna be good. So we're gonna get the bumper off. You're good at this, Jeff. Does it seem like everything down below is off? 
Yeah, what I can see. All right, let's uh, go top side. Okay, we gotta lift it up and over these guys. I'll let you do that. I don't blame you. Okay. All right, we got the front clip off. There's a handy little notch here where the crane can go. Um, all that really remains is to remove the bell housing bolts. Then we're gonna lower the car down, bring the crane in, just yank that sucker out of there. It's like pulling a tooth. Hey, uh, you're doing a great job, Jeff. Everybody thinks so. <laughs> hey, do you recognize these bolts? I don't remember where they came from. Oil cooler, that's what it is. You answered your own question. Dude, could you imagine if you weren't labeling this stuff and putting it in bags, how crazy it would be? <laughs> you're, you're the first guy that I've ever been around to put anything in a bag and labeled it. Believe me. But you know what? If it doesn't, if it's not too long of a time before you take something apart and you put it together, yeah. you actually don't forget. Right. It goes together. And you know, and of course there's a few left over, but you know, you just pitch those down the alley or something. And right. Hopefully nobody shows up with it. All right, I think I got, I have removed one, two, three, four, both, what I can see down here. Okay. So there's probably two more, three more up top, right? Four, um, is there seven I, I want to say there's eight. Um, I know, I'm almost certain there's an even number. Oh, what's that? Hey, shop dog, how you doing? <laughs> Which one is it? It's Josie. Josie. You're coming to give me a kiss and what? Just wanted uh, to see if you had any beef jerky in I, your pocket. You know what? Normally I do. <laughs> I don't go anywhere without beef jerky. I should remove these um, motor mount bolts as I'm down yeah, here. Well. I'm not used to taking bolts off cars you can take off with a 3 8 ratchet. Usually got a breaker bar and a torch. All right, we got more bell housing bolts. Ah! Ah! Yeah, it's good. It's good, yeah. <laughs> Lucky it didn't go through uh, bouncing, hit the windshield or something. Right. We'll always look at the bright side. Always look on the bright side of life. Boy, it work really looks cool when you look at it from different angles when other people are doing it. <laughs> yeah. Ah, I got it. Ah. ah. Get it? No. Mm. All right, Jeff. Jeffy boy. All right. Jeffy old so-and-so. I'm only here to help. Yeah, right. What I keep saying. You're the brains behind the operation. And everybody can tell. But sometimes you have to tilt to get the... Oh, <laughs> she's moving. Kind of stopped moving, didn't it? Is it tense? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna use this floor jack to support the torque tube so that when we remove the bell housing, the torque tube isn't just hanging there. So we ran into one last problem getting the engine out and it was kind of a geometry problem because in order to get the clutch free of the input shaft on the torque tube, we need to slide the engine forward about three inches but we can't slide the engine forward because it's being blocked by the studs for the motor mount. Those studs want you to lift the engine up a few inches. But if you lift the engine up a few inches, now that input shaft has friction and it won't slide free. So what we eventually realized was that we needed to remove the motor mounts from the block itself. That way we could slide the engine forward and then we could lift it up and out. So Jeff and I got into a little bit of an impromptu contest to see who could get their motor mount off the fastest. And I will say that I was feeling handicapped by having all the AC compressor stuff in my way. Even so, Jeff went at it with just a simple box wrench and I was trying ratchets and power tools and all kinds of stuff to get mine off. 
and Jeff just like knocked his out lickety split. I went to get a different tool to try. He came over to my side and got mine off too. So Jeff is hands down the superior mechanic. I, I fully admit it. Yeah. Old school wins. There we go. All right, what do you think? A little Yankee Yankee? A little tug? Well, the rest of the process of getting the engine out is not pretty, but we do manage to get it done. I'm gonna spoil that for you. This late in the video, I'm probably talking to a lot of the people who took the time to comment on the previous video where I talk about my plans for the motor. And first and foremost, I just wanna say thank you because so many of you put so much effort into those comments. There are 500 plus comments on that video and many of them, they're like essays. And close to half of those comments are from me. And that's because when you take the time to share your knowledge and your ideas with me, that means a lot to me. And so I try to respond. And if this channel keeps growing, someday we'll be at the point where I can't respond to everything. But for now, I'm trying to. And to be honest, spending a big chunk of my weekend replying to your awesome comments is my favorite part about releasing a video. And when I started this channel a few years ago, that's not what I was expecting at all. So what's next? I don't know. A couple of you reminded me that I'm building a GT3 killer, and I think that needs to guide my planning for the engine, but I need to sit down and really figure out what I personally want to do. And that means educating myself to the point that I can confidently make a decision. So thank you all for coming along for the ride. And thank you to Jeff for helping me have the best couple of days in the garage I can remember. We'll see you next time.